Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Abbas, and with me here is Team 14496, Robot5 from Escondido, California. They have just been absolutely incredible this season. I am so excited to interview them on Behind the Bot, jump into everything that they have going on with this amazing robot, new mechanum wheels, a bunch of sensors, really excellent path following, autonomous capabilities, teleop capabilities, and not to mention that they have the current world record at 416 points uh, with their partner. There's so much to talk about with Roboctopi, and it's all coming up on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions. Support Fun's content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and Fun members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the Join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Okay, guys. So I guess the first thing we have to do is just start with your drivetrain. You know, I remember back in like maybe September, October, I saw a post from you guys something about some new mechanum wheels you guys had done or changed the roller geometry. So really, I'm just here to listen. Why don't you guys walk us through what's going on there and then we'll jump into some more specific questions. So uh, we did some mathematical um, modeling of our mechanum wheels for our uh, software this year. And we noticed that our mathematical predictions didn't line up uh, with the performance of mechanum wheels. There was significantly more friction sideways uh, than the math predicted that there should be. And so uh, we investigated this issue and we found that um, the yellow structural components of the GoBuilda mechanum wheels actually scrape against the ground um, when, when you're moving around. And, it's, and this is especially when you're moving sideways because they're basically digging into the floor. Uh, and so the main thing that we fixed with the mechanum wheels is we made the rollers larger. So. Um, this is a normal mechanism roller, and this is our new mechanism roller. You can see they're larger in diameter. Mm -hmm. And this basically raises the plates off the ground and significantly decreases um, the, the friction going sideways. Uh, and then another thing I'd like to highlight about our uh, drivetrain is that we, we really focused on center of mass this year. Um, so you can see seven of our motors are right here on the ground along with our heavy battery. Uh, and there's a seven millimeter ground clearance so that uh, we can drive around and not worry about pixels getting stuck underneath our robot. Yeah, and so, you know, talking about those mechanisms, I mean, there's just like so much to discuss. I guess my first question is, uh, I'm sure you guys are very interested in quantifying um, the changes and, you know, the results. So what does that look like? You know, implementing these larger diameter rollers, what changes did you see uh, in your autonomous and your driving scores, things like that? The, the main thing we did test is we tested how much uh, additional friction there is, so how hard the robot is to push sideways versus forward. Mm -hmm. And compared to our last season robot, we found that the additional friction from going sideways compared to forward is actually three times less than it was before. So um, sideways motion and forward motion are much more similar in terms of how they move. Um, and uh, as a driver, I've just noticed that the robot's a lot more um, like efficient driving sideways and I don't have to worry about uh, which way the robot's rotating. I can kind of just translate in any direction at a very like similar speed. Wow. Since it's yeah. very efficient. No, that, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And so, you know, also from uh, like a driving perspective and I guess like everything going on there, talking a little bit about the sensors and how that plays into your drivetrain. What sensors do you guys use for autonomous localization? Uh, and, you know, if you also reuse them in Teleop, please uh, talk about that as well. Yeah, so we use uh, three-wheel odometry and we fuse that with uh, an external IMU because we've noticed that the internal IMU in the control hub crashes a lot. So we have an external one um, as well. And we actually did a similar thing with our odometry wheels that we did with the mechanism wheels. We actually made uh, completely custom Omni wheels as well that also have extremely high ground clearance uh, to eliminate any of the scraping. And we also reduced it last year and in all the other past years we've used uh, two Omni wheels that are kind of offset, but this year we only used uh, one wheel, um, our own custom design. Um, and then we also have two other sensors for localization and autonomous as well. So in the back here we have a camera uh, that's looking at the board and we localize uh, off of the April tags and reset our odometry. And then we also have two distance sensors 
uh, so we can get really accurate reading of how far away we are from the board. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with uh, using the April tags for backdrop relocalization, uh, how exactly does that work? Are you taking an image just once and then computing like the distance between or like the offset of your robot from the April tag that you detect or are you trying to continuously home in uh, on it or is it something different? Yeah, so we're, uh, um, we are in fact continuously homing off of the April tags um, and there's a couple reasons for that but the biggest one is just that that allows us to um, get more data to account for the noise in the April tag reading. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the issues we noticed with that is since there is latency between the camera taking an image and the robot moving, there is an offset basically in what the April tags position um, or what April tags think our position is and what our actual position is. So we're actually accounting for that by essentially predicting where the bot um, was when the photo was taken and then um, applying the adjustment to that uh, position which allows us to account for that, um, mm -hmm. those issues from movement. We also have a camera called a global, global shutter camera. So that takes images of the whole camera at once rather than um, each row at a time. So that means we don't get um, the image shared um, from rolling shutter while we're moving around. Sure. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that's a really interesting, uh, you know, application with the camera of like, backwards applying your position and making sure uh, that you have the offset correctly. So before you implemented that uh, algorithm, were you guys noticing that you were consistently missing uh, your backdrop placements or like they were always off by like the same amount? Or was this something that you implemented like right from the get go? Yeah, so when we were first implementing April tag, I know uh, we noticed that when it was moving around, it would give because essentially we plotted the air of where the encoders thought we were versus where odometry thought we were. And mm -hmm. if we moved, we would notice that air suddenly spikes and then goes back down. So because of that, we decided to um, implement that to try and reduce that spike and get our accuracy um, tighter or um, better. Sure. So um, we never, we ne didn't actually test our auto before that was in place because we wanted to make sure April tags were gonna give good data so it doesn't drive off and run into something or similar. But once we had, um, once we had done all that, we then um, added it to our auto and work basically first try. Yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense. Okay, I mean, as fantas fantastic as your guys' drivetrain is, there is just so much else to cover on this robot. So I guess let's get started with the intake. Again, why don't you walk us through the design and then we can talk about how it's progressed throughout the season. Yeah, so our intake is uh, roller-based. So we have a set of rollers all driven off of one motor. So we have this top roller here that sweeps pixels in and a um, counter spinning bottom roller that kicks them up off of the ground. And then we have another roller right behind it that uh, basically pushes the pixels all the way into the tray. Mm -hmm. And the way that our tray works, uh, the pixels are loaded in side by side. Um, and they've got, uh, if you want to come in here, Caleb, um, they load into this tray here and it's got uh, basically a W profile in the back so that the pixels um, can like correct their orientation. So they can come in in any orientation uh, and then they will align themselves like this in the back. Uh, and then uh, kind of the way that it moves up into our transfer, we've got uh, this set of fingers here um, that basically uh, lift up like this and hold on to this pixel for this tray to move from its down position where the pixels come in up to the transfer position. Sure, yeah. And so, you know, you guys have competed a lot this season. I mean, I think you've already had like five or six competitions. So, uh, you know, what do you think are some of the most significant iterations you've had on your intake that just really improved its consistency and reliability? Yeah, definitely. So we have lots of sensors in our intake uh, and this is where a lot of the improvements came from. So originally when we first built the intake, we just had these two color sensors here uh, that basically shine through and detect when the pixels entered in there using the proximity value. Uh, but we were noticing that there were um, lots of jams, so when these fingers uh, come up, sometimes they would jam against the pixel because those color sensors didn't detect when the pixel was fully seated inside of the tray. Mm -hmm. And so we added uh, these two levers in the back of the tray uh, that would basically trigger a touch sensor only when the pixel was fully seated into there. Uh, and so that drastically improved uh, all of our jamming issues. And then we also added a whole bunch of logic uh, to our driver control uh, that just deals with any other jams completely automatically. Awesome, yeah. And you know, as far as autonomous is concerned, we've seen a lot of teams this year try 
a bunch of different solutions, uh, you know, for intaking off of the pixel stack. And so for you guys specifically, are you using the same active roller um, that you use throughout the match for the pixel stack or do you have a different solution? Yeah, so we have this uh, drop down piece here, just driven off of a simple linkage. Uh, and we basically drop that down and knock the stack over mm -hmm. and then bring it back up and actively intake. I see. This, uh, we actually used to have this as a, a, another set of active rollers to try to spin the top pixel off the stack, but we found that just like a bar to knock over the stack first works better for us. Got it, yeah. And so, uh, you know, one last thing I want to ask about the intake. Obviously, you guys are no stranger to, you know, casting your own wheels or cylindrical objects, things like that. So are your active rollers on the front also cast uh, on their own or are those like a commercial product that you purchased? Um, yeah, so these are the Go Build a Boot wheels and uh, we are very familiar with the casting process. Uh, and that was definitely an option if um, we, we found it necessary to replace those rollers. But the simplest solution is best and, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of uh, time to manufacture all those rollers. So we went with this and then with, with the option in mind that we could change it if we needed to, yeah. but we haven't found it. Of course. Necessary. of course. So now going on to your deposit, you know, you mentioned that you have uh, the tray that comes up and you have your fingers and uh, you know, your pixels end up kind of oriented upwards. After that, how does your deposit pick them up and what goes on there? Yeah, so uh, our deposit system has an internal um, pixel, uh, like it grabs the pixel from the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, fully based off of our deposit strategy. So our, our strategy is to be able to place pixels precisely on the backdrop. Uh, so we have two systems in our deposit that allow us to do that. The first is that our whole intake, or sorry, our whole delivery system can spin around. Uh, so when we're holding two pixels, no matter the color, we can spin around to any of the six orientations, which allows us to build mosaics really easily. Um, for example, if there's one uh, pixel here, we can deliver two um, right on top of it to create that mosaic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second system in our delivery is that it can adapt to the board angle. So it's spring loaded like this. So any error in the rotation of the robot, either during autonomous or teleop, uh, the robot can just absorb that angle and correct for it. Uh, and so those two goals um, a lot like enabled us to, uh, or sorry, drove the decision to grab the pixel from the inside because we didn't want a bulky claw surrounding the pixels because mm -hmm. then when we spun that around, it could interfere with our delivery. Um, and then that drove our transfer strategy. So um, what, the way the transfer works uh, is the arm comes all the way into the robot. And when the two pixels are in the tray, this basically, uh, it's kind of hard to demonstrate by hand, uh, but this basically comes up like this and uh, homes right up against the arm and then the, the fingers or sorry, the internal claw just closes on the inside and then pulls it away. Sure. Uh, so we, one of the main goals here was to be able, have the tray be able to come up without the arm moving and then the, the arm grabbing the pixels and going. So we didn't want to have to bring the tray up, move the arm right, down, grab and in, go. Yeah, making the move in tandem is always messy. Uh, you know, it can lead to a exactly. lot of jams. And so now talking about your arm uh, and you know, the decision to spring load, uh, you know, the roll axis, I guess we would call it. Obviously, you guys have the technical knowledge to make it powered, uh, you know, add an extension, whatever you need. Um, but why did you decide just to make it sprung loaded instead of actively rotating? I mean, uh, like, just the main reasons that we don't really need to be able to control where it goes. Mm -hmm. All we need is for it to just be parallel to the board. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just um, like a much like simpler solution that just always tracks the board. Yeah. And also um, for automations, we do have an encoder actually that does read the angle of this. Um, so once it's offset, our code can use that to figure out where our robot is relative to the board. Um, so yeah, we do have some active data collection, but in terms of um, being passive, it's just to follow the board. Wow, yeah, no, that, that is really cool. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. And so I guess another question I have for you guys now uh, with your deposit is as far as um, game strategy goes, you know, having the world record 416 points and a slew of other very high scores, uh, what would you say uh, your advice is for teams that are looking to get those extremely high teleop scores? I mean, you have the 12th highest teleop OPR uh, right now, and as we said already, like the extremely high scores. So what advice do you have for other teams looking to do the same? Uh, I think one big piece of advice is take your time at the board. Uh, you know, uh, if you miss a delivery and um, make a mistake, that's a lot harder to correct. 
uh, than if you just spend an extra second or two um, placing on the board. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you actually watch our world record video, um, we were at the very end, we got a little bit excited. So we went a little fast and uh, one of our pixels uh, moved. And so our partner had to go and correct for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that your delivery is precise, whatever your delivery system is. Uh, just make sure you line up to where you know it's going to deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, just a couple last things before we wrap up. There's just so much to cover with this robot. Talking about your end game, I really want to focus on your guys' drone. I mean, I feel like every match I watched, it was just pretty much guaranteed zone one. Uh, so, you know, if you guys could give us some insight into how you achieve that sort of consistency and what testing goes into that, that would be fantastic. For sure. So. Uh, we built our own uh, linear motion system here, so it uses uh, an X-rail, uh, an extrusion, uh, and we printed our own like sled that rides inside of the rail mm -hmm. um, to create this spring-loaded uh, launcher system, and then we use bungee to uh, tension the drone. Um, and then it basically has a little latch here um, that you clip it into place, and then the servo doesn't need to um, spend any power holding it back. It just opens it and then releases the drone. Um, and the main goal of this system was to keep um, the moving part really, really light so that all of the energy uh, that came out of the system didn't go into accelerating heavy mass. It went to accelerating the drone. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also did mathematical calculations um, to kind of optimize our, our angle. And, and uh, we tuned it a bit as well and also tuning the tension uh, so that we stay under that five foot limit. Uh, and we can get into zone one every time. Before um, we wrap up, we just wanted to talk about our software. Yeah, so essentially, um, in order to control our robot, we use a library, um, a library which we created ourselves called Cuttlefish. So Cuttlefish has a bunch of um, really amazing features that make it possible to create our autos, um, not our autos and driver code very quickly and very effectively. Um, so that includes a. Um, our localization navigation system, and that's how we're able to um, move across the field very quickly and accurately. We have a queue-based um, scheduling system, and that essentially allows us to structure our autos and driver codes so that um, we don't have tasks or stuff interfere. Awesome, yeah. Roboctopi, thank you guys so much. I mean, I have been waiting so long to do this interview. I knew as soon as the season started, we'd have to talk to you guys about everything you've done with this robot, I guess. Now, looking forward, you have Houston coming up in about five, six weeks, I guess. Um, you know, any plans you want to share for that? Are we going to be seeing this? Are we going to be seeing a new robot? Uh, anything you guys want to add before we wrap things up? Yeah, so this is the robot we're bringing to Houston. Uh, we'll be making a couple of uh, small updates here and there on the, so on the hardware side. Uh, the main work is going to be in uh, getting a whole bunch of different autos set up so that we can uh, work with any alliance partner and uh, be effective. Yeah, awesome. Well, Roboctopy, thank you guys so much. I can't wait to see you guys compete in Houston. You know, last year you had a great run into ELIMS. I'm hoping this year it's, you know, even further. It's always a pleasure to see you guys compete. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abahas, and this is Team 14496, Roboctopy from Escondido, California. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions.